It is really a tremendous honor for us to have Jeremy Grantham here today. We've um, been so blessed by his philanthropy, his thinking, his way of looking at the big picture, stepping far back and looking at how we need to address the issues that really impact our lives and our times. And I feel like Jeremy's been sort of the canary in the tunnel. You know, he's been talking about climate change for a long time, and I think people are finally starting to realize that it is hitting home and it's gonna hit hard. So we're so, so pleased to have him here today. I'm sure you all know his many accomplishments, so I'm not gonna tell you all about that, but we'd like you to give Jeremy a warm welcome. And thank you. Climate change is a, an odd topic to be talking about these days. It, it clearly, it clearly doesn't matter. Climate change doesn't matter much, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here as the EPA is being disassembled and all the climate regulations are being thrown out as fast as they can organize them. It, uh, similarly, the weather is behaving so well, uh, completely normal. Uh, it is quite amazing that we sit here on a day where we just had this so-called so bomb for the second time in two months. And uh, Houston, of course, last year, it wasn't the first time. Over a four-year window, they had a 50 to 100-year flood. Within 18 months, a 100-year flood. And then last year, it doesn't really matter what you call it, it's off the scale. You could call it a 1,000-year flood, or you could call it an impossible flood. But to have three of those, in a four-year window is beyond inconceivable. And the climate is moving much faster than we would have ever uh, suspected. Th this uh, talk should be framed a little. Um, I'm in the financial business, and what I've tried to do for 15 years is weasel into my financial stuff a little bit of the environment. And, and attempting to nag my colleagues into having more environmental products with total lack of success <laughs> until last year when we started a climate change fund, which was brilliant for me because now, instead of being off topic, I'm suddenly on topic again. And uh, the last few weeks, I've had a remarkable uh, set of coincidences in, in which I've been asked to deliver a talk that really is the intersection between finance and climate, which is a very sparsely occupied uh, position, so I have a kind of monopoly. <laughs> and, uh, so in January, I got to speak uh, at the UN, to the UN Foundation, and uh, Ceres, who every two years have a big bash. It's very exciting, they all have electronic nameplates, and, and you push your button, yes, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Secretary General. And uh, although there were no translators, the boxes were empty. And uh, on Thursday last week, I got to speak in the congressional buildings to uh, the uh, Gardening Club of America. 400 truly dynamic women, absolutely my favorite audience of all time. <laughs> I, I'm now only going to speak to women. <laughs> it, it does appear that they resonate more on this topic than men, and certainly than businessmen. The race of our lives comes from the fact that when I talk to technologists, uh, they're wildly enthusiastic, uh, and they have no idea how, how dreadful uh, the environment is and how rapidly it's going downhill. And then I talk to environmentalists who are full of the woes of life, and they have no idea how exciting and how fast-moving the technology is. And uh, hence the race of our lives. It is the most important race, probably, that humans have engaged in. And uh, just to frame this, we've been around for 12,000 years of increasing civilization, 300,000 years in total. And uh, technology has accelerated, on one hand, the population on the other. But if you go back just 100 years, and you say, if we froze the population at just under two billion, 
one and a half billion. And we had the technology of today, we would have no problems. We would cruise into the future effortlessly, solving all the problems as we go along, including basically global poverty. Uh, the technology is just sufficient to do that. If, on the other hand, you reverse that, and you took today's population of seven and a half billion, and you froze the technology of 100 years ago, we are absolutely toast. There is no hope that we will maintain a stable civilization under those conditions. As it is, it's a real horse race. Technology is moving like the cavalry trying to head us off at the cliff as we seem sometimes bound and determined to throw ourselves off. And I was asked three years ago at a Fortune conference what I thought the odds were, and I said what I honestly thought then, 50-50. And in the last three years, I would say we have not been winning this war, and I've reduced it to 45, 55 against. And what I mean by success is that you could come back in 50 years and you would recognize the world as being approximately as stable and as reasonable or unreasonable uh, as it is today. So I have a modest definition of success. And failure is that it has been, in a kind of serial way, becoming more unstable with more failing states, more dictatorships, and so on, more compromises to democracy. And, uh, for the last two or three years in particular, it has been obviously quite noticeable in what direction we've been moving. So bear in mind this presentation is directed at either sophisticated businessmen who understand charts and graphs and take them in in three seconds, or absolutely fanatical environmentalists, uh, and uh, we'll do the best we can. So, Three issues to further frame the discussion. You could say our population, <coughs> carbon dioxide, and fossil fuels. <coughs> what fossil fuels did, really, is they fueled the Industrial Revolution. They always say it was inventions like the steam engine, but the steam engine, if you only had wood, would have been a damp squid. What the steam engine needed was coal, and then oil, and that's what it got. And the Industrial Revolution hurtled us into the future. It enabled us to take the energy in a gallon equal to 300 hours of human labor, so that we have at our control more fossil fuel slaves than an emperor of 3,000 years ago. It enabled us to have a surplus, to grow more food, to have a surplus for culture and, and science. And it enabled us, above all, uh, to breed like rabbits. And, uh, and we did. We went up to the limits of our capability, which is how all animals have always lived. Uh, your beaver populations, your rat populations, they move up to the limits of the food supply. And the problem with this is that fossil fuels are finite and they have developed a world that is not sustainable. And this kind of tide of fossil fuel power has carried us far beyond our long-term sustainable margin. And we're kind of up in the sand dunes on a very, very high tide, uh, flapping around wondering uh, what we will do. Our population I'll deal with in a minute or two, but suffice it to say, when Malthus wrote his piece in about 1800, there was one and a quarter billion people. When I was born in 1938, there were just over two, and now there's seven and a half. <laughs> Global population has tripled in my lifetime. After a very, very slow, hardly moving run, it's escalated in a dramatic, accelerating way. If you see that in the stock market, you duck, trust me. Uh, it means bad things. The official forecasts from here, from the UN, going out to 2100, are 16 billion is the highest, 8 billion the most optimistic, and 12 billion of the mid-range. And uh, 
the real problem we'll get to is how you feed 12 billion people in the face of climate change, erosion, and other problems. And the third issue is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has some very interesting properties. If we had none, the temperature of the world would be minus 25 degrees centigrade. It would be basically a solid ball of ice, and there would be very little life, if any at all. So thank heavens that carbon dioxide has this remarkable capability that a few parts per million can have a very substantial uh, effect on the heat. In the last 400,000 years, this is a popular graph from Al Gore, the, the range has been uh, 180 to uh, almost 300. A range of 120 parts per million, which is nothing. At 180, some parts of the world are doing fine, but New York City is two miles under ice. At the bottom of that graph, four times in a row, we were deep in an ice age. The ice ages have taken up almost 80% of all the time in the last 400,000 years. And the interglacials, of which we also have four or five there, uh, are rather brief in comparison. We've had 12,000 years of recovery this time, enough to develop our entire civilization. And we were about scheduled to go back down into another ice age, but it would have been tens of thousands of years. However, we came along. And uh, we did the famous Al Gore trick. We have added 120 basis points per million since 1950. We have added, just recently, in the blink of an eye, as much carbon dioxide as separates the depths of the ice age from the warm interglacials. And we will add another 120 before we're finished. That, I give you my personal guarantee. We can't possibly avoid that. So we will triple the carbon dioxide. It is a noble or ridiculous experiment, dangerous beyond belief. <clears throat> We've had a problem, in my opinion, with scientists. They are very respectful of the dignity of science. They're very uh, nervous about their own careers. Who isn't? Career risk plays a big role in everybody's life. They don't want ever to be caught overestimating a problem. My counterattack is, yes, it's very dangerous to overstate anything in science except this. If you understate climate science, and you affect a difference in policy and belief by people in the street and by politicians, you may be making a dreadful mistake with, with untold consequences. It is absolutely important that they at least say what they honestly believe instead of being so damn conservative. And by a series of extreme coincidences, I, I got a commentary in, in the journal Nature uh, which said four years ago, be persuasive, be brave, be arrested, in parentheses, if necessary. <laughs> and um, in which I harangued the scientists in, in, in the environment for being chickens and pointing out what I just pointed out. I got some very interesting hate and love mail. Back. <laughs> so all of the science journals until the last 12 months understated the issue. In the last 12 months, due to politics, there has been a sudden and obvious change. The tone of the articles has increased. They have become more outspoken. And particularly, the one word that interests me is acceleration. It was clear for the last four or five years, this exhibit is in here because I did it four years ago. I have sentimental attachment to it. <laughs> because I was the first person who said it was clearly accelerating. You don't have to be a mathematician to see it's clearly accelerating. And um, they would not use the word because they were so cautious. The first 50 years of the last century, we had this very modest 0 0.007 degrees centigrade increase. A year in the next 50 years, we had 15. And if you uh, do the next one, you'll see that between the two El Ninos, which is a a Pacific Ocean effect that causes extremely localized in time uh, high increase in temperature. You'll see from 
1998, the infamous one that gave rise to the nonsense of a pause in climate change, until the extreme one also that we had in 2016, that the increase is 25 basis points from peak to peak. It appears to be going 7, 15, 25. It is not just that we are losing the war, it's that we're use, losing it at, at an accelerating rate. If that doesn't make the hair on the back of your neck prickle, then you should go to the bar again. Okay. This one, it's the same in the water. This is the temperature of water. Only look at the black line, which is all the water down to 2,000 meters. And this is even scarier because from 1950 to 1990, which is quite recently, the water increased to 37 heating units a year. And since 1990, the other day, in the last 26 years, it's been going up at 99, more than two and a half times. Now let me ask you an honest question. I mean, are you aware of this? I mean, who is aware of this kind of rate of acceleration in the two basic data points, air temperature and water temperature, two of you? Uh, I mean, it is shocking beyond belief. And, and now, finally, the articles are, are, are talking about acceleration. The other thing you'd notice if you follow the science is that for every 10 articles on climate change, to be generous, two of them say, whoops, we've discovered something that might uh, make things better. And 80%, and, and it's more than 80 to be honest, 80% of them say, whoops, we've discovered something that makes it even worse. Mm -hmm. And that's been the pattern for 15 years. We have a foundation which uh, helped start a climate research institute for science at, um, in London and, and for economics at Imperial <coughs> College and London School of Economics. And the net result of that and other things we've done is that we get to talk to very good scientists on a very regular basis. And uh, so in that, in that sense, we're up to date and we get to test all our theories fairly often. And, and uh, there are consequences uh, of this heat rising of, of a more down to earth observable nature. And that is downpours. Of all the effects of climate change, the one that is most dependable is an increase in heavy downpours. As the temperature rises, water vapor can be carried at a greater density. So there's 4% going on 5% more water vapor in the air than there was 100 years ago. And that means, basically, you will have more intense storms. And this is just one inch downpour a day. And, and of course, they get much greater than that, but they have all the same effect. They, uh, they're moving up from left to right. And they're doing so, as Houston found out, at, at a rather rapid rate. The consequences of this for business and, and expenses and the GDP are quite severe. The floods are going up steadily, the droughts, the wildfires, the extreme temperature events. This does not include the great droughts and fires in California. It does not include Houston. Last year, $330 billion of damages from events that were made much worse by climate change. Just a word on that, by the way, because you hear such complete nonsense by the well-organized uh, powers of disinformation uh, fueled by the fossil fuel business, is that uh, hurricanes may or may not be more common. That's very complicated. It may very well turn out the climate change will make them less common. They may originate less. All we know about climate change at the moment for sure is that when they occur, they have more power, more energy. They take their energy from the temperature of the water, which is provably uh, quite a lot warmer than it used to be. And in, the, and, and in the hurricane pass, like the great New York hurricane, was up to four or five degrees centigrade warmer uh, than normal. And, and uh, one we have to floods. worry about, as we'll come to later, because uh, heavy floods uh, are the, the great villain of erosion. 
which is much, much more important than flooding Miami in the long run. Farmers are not completely stupid. They, they don't uh, lose much soil uh, in, a, in even a heavy rain. They lose soil in the really heaviest two or three days a year. It's what they call a power law. It has absolutely no effect until the extreme floods. And then every couple of years, they have such a heavy flood, they wake up in the morning, and there's an eight-foot gully deep uh, running through some of the best Midwestern fields. And they plow it over and start again uh, the following day. But, but heavy floods and erosion are, in my opinion, going to turn out to be the single most dangerous component of climate change. But, on, on the good news, the technologies have been quite remarkable. They are moving much faster and have covered more ground than almost any well-educated businessman is aware of. And uh, they seem to be accelerating. And we are going to decarbonize our economy. In fact, you can say, if you look at the science, never underestimate the ability of science to pull a rabbit out of the hat. Never say, this can never happen. It may very well happen, and often has. And on the bad side, never underestimate the power of Homo sapiens to screw it up. <laughs> so this is um, getting a little pointy corporate, but it's, it is incredibly important. It's from the horse's mouth. You might say someone from the dark side. This is the CEO of the largest elect electric company, utility company in America. He also has the largest trading for wind and solar. So he knows what he's talking about. Florida Power and Light uh, as well. Now, what he said in June on the telephone to stockholders was this. New wind and new solar starting to build it today without incentives and combined with storage, which is absolutely critical, are going to be cheaper than the operating cost, that is the marginal cost, of operating a nuclear plant or a coal plant that you already have. In other words, rather than dig the coal, ship the coal and burn it in an existing plant, it is cheaper from now on to get out there and build a brand new wind or solar farm in, in many states. I hardly have that, well it hasn't been digested actually, but in any case, four weeks ago now, um, Excel Corp, a utility in Colorado, uh, thinking that it might close down a couple of its coal plants a bit early, has set out, sent out for proposals. They had a stunning 850 proposals, of which 350 were for wind and solar with battery storage of a few hours. If you have four hours, you pick up as the sun goes down, that enormous increase in demand as everybody comes home from uh, 5 to 9 o'clock. And they, the median, that, the median means half of them are cheaper than this, is 2.1 pennies per kilowatt hour. The median coal is 5 pennies per kilowatt hour, the median. The lowest the Florida Power and Light has is 3 pennies. This is 2.1 pennies, and this is for 2023, this is in five years. The previous guy was saying sometime next decade. So, and this is just six months later. And the bid for storage was not even a penny, 0.3 to 0.7 of a penny, down from one and a half pennies as recently as the previous bid in May 2017. So this is a done deal. In terms of economics, we are going to decarbonize the electricity business. And when it comes to economics that strong, red states like Texas line up in a mad dash to put up wind towers. They have the largest wind electricity of any state as a percentage and growing the fastest. Uh, theory is fine, politics is fine, but in the end, capitalism is pretty straightforward. <laughs> if you can make money, you do it. <clears throat> now, just to take a, an aside here, <clears throat> if this had not happened, if we could not make money, if we had to pay twice the electricity cost to go green, we'd still have to go green.
but we wouldn't do it. It's obvious that in this state of duress, that the climate is not nearly unstable and threatening enough to affect, to affect that. We will not greenify materially unless it pays us to do it. I mean, that's a fairly tragic thought, and that is the truth. The token greening that gets done at an expense is not 1% of the game. You have to make these things economic if dopey, greedy homo sapiens is going to make it. And praise be, it appears to look like that. This is the scale of the decline since 2000. I mean, look at that. From 400, from $4 a megawatt hour to uh, have fun. Let me get this right. From $400 to $50 per megawatt hour. And uh, offshore, onshore wind uh, down there at 40. And the next blip, please, will show you that uh, the median coal plant is decently higher. This is only a two-year-old exhibit, and when we first did it, as the title says, we said will reach, and now it's possible, just like that. I want to say a little thing about wind, because it was one of the things that up until a year ago I said offshore wind is a complete waste of space, so expensive to build, so expensive to maintain, you have to get out there in the stormy seas, forget it. It, it may be politically desirable because no one wants a windmill in their backyard, but economic, economically, it, it's hopeless. And, and I was wrong. And that has taught me a lesson I hope I will learn permanently. But this shows you what is happening to windmills. In 2000 at scale, there's a two megawatt windmill. This is bigger than the one in Fall River. But bigger than the ones really you cycle past in Holland. It's a big windmill, two megawatts. You can go out today off the shelf and buy a nine and a half. You don't even have to be uh, negotiating. Uh, they are actually constructing 12 megawatt ones, bigger than that 2020, uh, which is pretty much as tall as the Eiffel Tower at the top of its wingspan. We just went up the Eiffel Tower a few months ago. Uh, it, it's impressively tall. And uh, things you don't know about windmills. <coughs> First of all, when you go from a, a 10 foot blade to 20 foot, you don't get twice the energy. You get four times, brought to you courtesy of pi r squared. And it's the, the energy is proportional to the swept area. Um, so bigger is better. And more important and more interesting to me is that the wind speed, when it goes from 10 to 20 miles an hour, you don't get double, you don't get quadruple, you octuple the power. And that is why a hurricane at 140 miles an hour is so much deadlier than 120. It is not 15%. It's 15% cubed. It's 70% more dangerous and more powerful than a hurricane at 120. And when you work that out, you realize that if you can build a monster in the North Sea where the wind is pretty well always blowing somewhere, and even a single one has a utilization rate very close to 50. The average of the past in Texas has been 21. But in, in modern technology and in the North Sea, it's close to 50. And um, what was I talking about? Yes, <laughs> windmills in the North Sea. Um, you can't build, at the moment, those kind of monsters on land. So it's not a fair fight. You have to build them on the coast, put them on a ship specially designed, send it out, put it on its concrete base, which they can do currently in 10 hours for a nine and a half megawatt, instead of three days the old way. And when you go up, this was my point, when you go up higher, the wind speed goes up a little bit. Nah, not much. It goes from, let's say, 14 to 16, from 10 to 12, but then you cube it. So a tall windmill gets 60% more power than a small one. Plus it gets the, the square of the blade length. Now these are monsters. My guess is in 30 years, the cheapest unit of energy anywhere on the planet will be from giant offshore 
window. It was a cliche as recently as the other day, 2010, that batteries had let us down. We had Moore's Law here and there, we had solar dazzling us, and batteries had a 50 year past of 3% a year. I mean, that really is not bad, but pretty tame uh, compared to what we needed. And the moment it became a cliche, this is what happened. Year by year, it collapsed in price. Tesla charged $1,000 for a kilowatt hour vehicle 2010, its first machines. This year, 150. <coughs> and when they're making 20, 30, 40 million do uh, electric cars, the price of that, just from engineering, just from the usual tricks of scale, they will have it. So, and that is enough. That will make the cost of an electric car cheaper than an internal combustion. It's already much cheaper to run, has 15% of the moving parts. Its lifetime ownership is cheaper already, but when you have halved the batteries and halved them again, it will be ridiculously the cheapest vehicle. And uh, the Grantham Foundation, I'm happy to say, is investing in a solid state uh, lithium ion which was also announced yesterday that the Massachusetts company is hot on our heels. Yeah. Uh, we've made so many lemon investments in, in, in the energy area, and uh, we need a big hit to catch up. <laughs> and um, Quantum Skate in Los Angeles is our firm, and uh, it takes half the resources uh, of a regular lithium ion. It charges in five minutes and it doesn't burst into flame. <laughs> all, all of the qualities I was nervously reading this morning from yesterday's news about the firm in Massachusetts. So even if we don't get it, someone will get it. So rapid charging takes away that, that problem with electric cars. And half the materials mean it's half the weight. Think of this for your telephone and your iPads. Half the space and above all, half the cost. So, at scale, Tesla 75 will go to 40. It will be cheap. There's a, a consulting firm in Norway um, that's been consulting with oil companies for over 100 years and, and with uh, wind and solar for 30, 40 years. It's generally considered an arm's length operation. And having gone through their recent study, which is free online, um, I realized that they are aggressive in their assumptions as I am. And uh, in other words, they're up, they're up <coughs> to the state of the art. And uh, they are assuming massive progress in the areas that I've talked about. And the bad news is, this is what it looks like. The green renewables go zooming up, and by 2050, the bad news is, fossil fuels are still 51, 52% of the total, all energy used globally. Uh, gives you some idea, yeah. the next one please, of the scale of this problem. Even if fossil fuel peaks out about now, and it may plateau for 10 years before it drops, the carbon emission continues to go up until the day it hits zero. And, uh, <coughs> and just that previous exhibit guarantees this. We will hit 1.92 degrees centigrade. Uh, one and a half is hopeless, and we will hit this by 2050, and we still have to deal with the second half of the fossil fuels. We will have a hard time stopping this go, going to three degrees centigrade. And the consequences of even where we are today, we don't know. Let me just point out that the glaciers and the ice caps of Greenland and so on are melting at today's temperature which means if you froze it, they would keep on melting. That's what temperature and ice do. Today's temperature is enough to melt Greenland eventually. That's 13 feet on its own, and then all of the glaciers in the world will go at one degree centigrade. And one degree cent centigrade is the global number. The number in the Arctic, as you have probably been reading, is more like three degrees. The Arctic, the other day, as the cold blast was freezing them in Finland and all the way down to Rome, 
the Arctic was way over freezing, and it's still total night there. It's the 124 hours a day black winter. And they had, have had already this winter more hours above freezing than they have ever had before times three. And um, most days you can find that uh, somewhere in Alaska or somewhere in northern Greenland is warmer than, and then you read it off, Helsinki or somewhere civilized. This is aimed at the portfolio types. The amount of money to decarbonize is, is absolutely colossal. It will rise to $2 trillion a year, and uh, it's the biggest reshuffling of the economy since the Industrial Revolution. Fossilizing was huge, and defossilizing is going to be equally huge. Fossilizing was a luxury that allowed us to grow, defossilizing is a matter of life and death. Energy efficiency luckily started quite modestly for every unit of GDP. We did use less energy on the way up, but now in recent years it's been accelerating and the estimate for the future uh, is that it will be substantially faster than it has been, which is all good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about this. But it's why agriculture should play such a big role in our thinking at the investment level and everyone else's role. It's the biggest risk uh, that we face. That's the old uh, graph of population. Read it and weep. But that's where we are. Okay, on we go. And, and what isn't realized uh, on the good side is the fertility rate in the entire developed world has fallen below replacement cost. The dotted line across the page is replacement, and uh, all developed countries have fallen below it. China is way below it, 1.6, replacement is 2.1. And uh, if it was just the developed world in 200 years, we would cruise down to perhaps 3 or 4 billion. It happens very quickly. If you have a Japanese growth rate of 1.5, it means every generation you have 25% less students arriving at university. They are down to 75, and in 25 or 30 years, there will be 75 of 75, and so on at this rate. It really happens very fast in reverse. Even more impressively, um, we have Iran at the bottom. Iran in 1960 had seven children per woman, and it's now 1.6. It can be done. It takes a determined governmental effort. And Bangladesh is my favorite though. Dirt poor, has no oil like Iran. Muslim country that has its own complications. And they've come down also from seven uh, to 2.2. Just by determined, persistent government effort, women with a moderate amount of, of training arriving at the village in a persistent way counseling with the local women. The problem is that, um, and again, please. The problem is Africa. <coughs> Over on the right at the bottom, of the median estimate for 2100, pretty well all of them are scheduled to be in Africa. 3.3 billion extra Africans. There are more expected incremental Nigerians than the rest of the world added together. When I was born, there were 28 million Nigerians. There's 190 million today, and the UN official forecast is for 800. 40% of them in a recent poll would like to emigrate to Europe, mostly to the UK. The UK is an overcrowded island of 65 million. You can just imagine what 40% of 800 million would do. Just to digress, Europe cannot deal with the migrants from Africa caused by overpopulation. There is no way. Sadly, I wrote four years ago that the first casualty of this would be the liberal traditions of Europe. What did I know? Uh, I didn't expect it to be anywhere near this rapid. But in the end, Europe has to kind of bite the bullet and, and make it clear they simply cannot take food refugees from Africa. 
It doesn't compute, just work it out. All of their social fabric would collapse before they had taken your guess, 100 million? We've seen what happens when they take a million and a half. You've got right-wing movements coming out of the woodwork. A hundred million would blow Europe sky high. They can't do it. And a hundred isn't even a down payment on the scale of this particular problem. So the key to our future is let's have a more careful population progression in Africa. You can't mention this in polite mm -hmm. NGO circles. They will not mention it even though everyone knows it's the biggest problem. Let me digress again. Someone says, how do I save? my carbon footprint. And you get a long list of a hundred things, and you add them all up, and you get one unit, okay? And then they say, but take one less trip to Europe, and you get three units. Taking a jet <coughs> flight of 5,000 miles is more than everything else you can do multiplied by a factor. So let's say that's three units. And out there, that 17 or 20 units is having one less child. Not one less child, you have to think of this, is they will take jet flights. They will do all these things, as will their progeny forever. You can see how dramatic that is. And you read the most incredible nonsense from politically correct circles on the topic of population. If Africa doesn't control its population growth, they will disintegrate. No, I'll phrase it worse than that. They are already at a fairly rapid, discouraging rate, disintegrating as we sit. You could name, I think, pretty easily five failed state African states. Libya, Mali, Chad, Somalia, etc. You could name five, like Nigeria, that are thinking about, that are having real stress. This is the world food demand goes up steadily as if nothing will shake it. And this is the productivity of grain. Grain does 80% of the heavy lifting, calorie-wise. And due to the Green Revolution, you had this huge surge from 1960 uh, to uh, 1973, let's say, where you average 3.3% increase every year. I mean, that is amazing. Every 10 years, uh, sorry, every three years you had 10% more output from your acre of wheat. It's just remarkable. Not surprisingly, it came down and it, it bounces around due to the weather, which is pretty volatile. And uh, it ends up on this exhibit at 1.2, um, exactly the same as the growth rate of people. We are creating more people at exactly the same rate as we are able to increase our wheat production. It's a dead heat, there is no room all the decent land is used, and the land we're using is getting worse. This is the productivity by 20-year blocks, 1930 to 50, uh, way down at 1.5, but still a pretty handsome rate. And then the Green Revolution, this amazing, miraculous surge, which was introduction of vast quantities of fertilizer coupled with the redesign of, of the grain so that they were shorter and stronger. Uh, and wouldn't fall over as they grew faster. And then, as the effect has worn off, as we enter diminishing returns, the productivity 70 to 90 fell back to where it had been. 90 to 2010 uh, fell another 50 bits. And our estimate at, at my firm, GMO, is that we will be down, other things being perfectly equal, will be down to 0.8. Why does this occur? It, it's the law of diminishing returns. You cannot make racehorses get faster and faster and faster. As you get up to the 1920s, where you've been doing it for a few thousand years, however hard you push, they don't get much faster. They don't beat the records of 1920 by more than the odd hoof uh, these days. It can't be done. And the same has happened in grain. If you want to see diminishing returns, what you have to do is go to the best grain producers in the world. America produces the best amount the most per person, farmer and his son with 6,000 acres. Absolutely nowhere near the most per acre. The most per acre, Germany, France, UK, for wheat and for rice, Japan. And uh, this is what the productivity looks like.
for those best of breed. You can see it rises very steadily until the last 15 years. They are simply getting as much blood out of the stone as you can get. <coughs> and this is one reason, huge surge of fertilizer. It should go back to the left, ideally, uh, where it comes from one to two and then up to nine units and then it starts to wiggle its way sideways. The US and China already use more fertilizer than is optimal for the crop. And the other thing which you don't read about is erosion. As you erode the soil, in marginal cases, you start to eat into the productivity. And, and, and they reckon that by 2040, this will cost us 10% of the global crop. And in this work, you will not read about climate change. This is one of the shocks to me in the last couple of years, to realize how, how, how small a bailiwick each scientist operates in. You don't find the erosion experts talking about climate change. It's a completely different branch of science. And you don't find the climate guys mentioning erosion. And, and that. This is a village, a, a, a town in Iowa, that happened uh, to keep a track from 1850 of its top soil. 14 inches is a plethora. You don't need anything like that. And then it drops by 1900, 11 and a half, 9 and a half, 7 inches, 5 and a half. Trust me, 5 and a half is like a blessing. If you have 5 and a half, you're, you're some of the best, most productive you can be. But just keep doing that and you'll be at two, which starts to impact, and then one, which means you get a miserable crop, and then, of course, zero. Look at the relentless way that is dropping. We are losing about 1% of our soil a year, and the experts say that we have 30 to 100 good crop years left, depending on where you are. So this is, there are two reports, believe it or not, that are the worst reports the most pessimistic reports that I have come across, both of them in the last six months. No. This one, um, this is a real backbreaker, because you want a report that tells you productivity is going to help to come from some marginal journal. And this comes from the proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences, which is bad, bad news. And it's only a few months old, and it had the usual 12 scientists. And what they did is they went back 50 years, they looked at the effect on grain production in America of a drought, of a flood. And then they looked during the 50 years, as the incidence of floods and droughts have gone up, they just took the actual effect. They looked at the effect of temperature increases, which had more or less no effect until the last handful of years. A heat effect is, is geometric. It doesn't really hurt until it starts to really hurt but quite suddenly, and we haven't reached that point yet, but we will in the next 50 years. And they worked out that if the droughts and floods continue to increase at the rate that the scientists agree is very likely, and the, and the floods part is the most dependable of all, that we would reach, by 2040, the productivity level in America that we had in 1980. In other words, we are on the cusp of going in, into reverse. This report does not mention the word erosion. Erosion is completely separate, and it's a killer in its own right, and these guys won't even mention the word, okay? So you will never have seen the following exhibit, which is a really crude, primitive attempt to put erosion and climate on the same exhibit, a decline of 53% from what otherwise would have occurred, but this does not include, A, the underlying decline in marginal return, the exhibit that I showed you coming down very slightly but steadily, and it does not include the dramatic effect of increased heavy downpour on erosion causing a more rapid erosion effect than is modeled here. Other problems facing big ag, water availability you read a lot about. Urban expansion tends to be in, in the lush river valleys. Bug and pathogen immunity, we have big ag is a, 
a way of breeding Superman. Uh, they kill 99.999% of the wimps, and the one bug that makes it then inherits the world, and all the progeny thereafter are his, or hers. And uh, you have superbugs, superbugs and superweeds, and this is the killer. After all the money spent by farmers, knowing they had to do what the advisor from Monsanto and the USDA told them to do, it costs exactly the same percentage loss of the crop today that it did in 1945. I mean, read it and weep. We just engaged in a very expensive equal war Lux. of attrition. Lux can go on forever. Toxic environment. And this is the second of the two ugliest papers that came out. And the bad news here is not proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, but it was done by an army of Germans. I'm married to a German. I can impugn them uh, without risk. And what I'm impugning them with in this case is, is their ability to be consistent and accurate and get the job done. Every day since 1989, on the same night of each year, with incredible care, they've gone out and put a net in the same spot in a German forest. And they've collected each year, for 28 years, every insect that came in that little patch, that one night. And uh, you would really like this to be a harebrained study, badly done. It is absolutely not. It's guaranteed to be right. And it was picked up by academics early this year. It's not fully digested yet, and you will hear a lot more about it. They were utterly horrified, as everyone must be, 75% all the flying insects in the forests of Germany have gone missing. We have studied monarch butterflies. We knew they were in trouble. Bees, we knew they were in trouble. We didn't realize that every flying insect in Europe, at least, is in trouble. Europe is a very dense place. So you don't have to be outside a refinery. Even in a forest, you're close to farm. You can't get far away from a farm in Germany. And they use pesticides, insecticides, and these things are poisonous. You know, some tiny fraction of, of a milligram uh, goes anywhere near a bee, and, and they die. And without pollinating insects, we go out of business. So this is the most threatening of all of them, maybe. We have just created a toxic environment. The sperm count of humans is said to be, in the developed world, down 50%. No one's concerned. That was a meta-study study of 400 studies. Do we worry at 75 or 87 and a half? I have no idea. But it does seem that simply the toxicity is more than life is having an easy time. My guess, by the way, is we will pick up on this in the next few years. And we will be much more concerned than climate change, which is a bit like warming the frog slowly in the pan. But this stuff, this is our life. And health issues are more immediate. And people respond more urgently. My guess is they're going to pick this up in the next five years and we're going to move five times the speed. And the oil companies who think they're going to fall back on chemicals are going to find that they're having their asses sued more on chemicals than they are on, on their lying through their teeth on climate change. Uh, Exxon, in 72, had a small army of trained scientists who uh, had peer-reviewed articles on the guarantee that carbon dioxide was trouble. Oil companies should take it into account. It would change the weather. It would have and, and raise the water levels. They had an ocean-going ship doing research, very expensive. And, and then uh, in 73, they had a new CEO who stopped all that and used the money to fund uh, obfuscation campaigns at uh, Keio Institute and a dozen other respectable sounding places, uh, which is misrepresentation of the danger of your product, knowing that it causes harm, exactly like tobacco and asbestos. And they are being sued, as we sit here, uh, in 50 different suits. And they, oh, sorry. The final point there was the global distribution of phosphate, phosphorus. Let me tell you something about growing anything. You've got to have water, you've got to have soil, you've got to have nitrogen. You've also got to have phosphorus and potassium that people don't necessarily realize. You cannot grow any living thing without phosphorus and potassium. You're one and a half percent by body weight. 
uh, phosphorus. Which is pretty scary because we mine them for big ag. We go to mines all over the world. We grab it, grab it out in the hundreds and millions of tons and we scatter it over the fields until the mines run out. Our phosphorus mines in Florida are deep into running out mode and the biggest one has already been closed. And you can't grow them. It's an element you can't substitute, you can't redesign. This is it, guys. You've got to have phosphorus and potassium. And you can do it by nurturing farming old school, where you allow the natural amount that comes up from the bedrock. Uh, nature did perfectly fine having tropical forests using these limitations. But um, we are using it, depleting a finite resource. It turns out Morocco has 75% of the entire world's high-grade, low-cost phosphorus reserves. They are not, they make OPEC, let alone Saudi Arabia, look like pikers. And in the end, eating is more important than heating. And uh, if ISIS shows up in Morocco, you better believe the Chinese military, the US military, and the European military will want to intercede. Because China and the US, the US is an incredible, haven. It has everything except phosphorus. Everything. And if we look after our wonderful friends in Canada, they have enough potassium to see us both through any crisis. So we must be nice to Canada. <laughs> everything else we have coming out of our ears. People like to talk about New Zealand. So we did a little run at that. We have more arable land per capita <coughs> and more water availability per capita in North America beyond Mexico than New Zealand has, with its, with its little <coughs> handful of four million people. Isn't that amazing? We have everything except phosphorus. <coughs> Just a word on capitalism. <coughs> I'm a capitalist, made by normal standards tons of dough, which I'm very thrilled with because we stick it in the foundation and we use it for these kind of purposes. Uh, our foundation, a third of it goes to what I like to call propaganda, trying to get the real hard science out and influence policy with the politicians and, and, and we the people. <coughs> and uh, some, a little bit goes for research and uh, other, other climate change oriented battle plans. The problem with capitalism, it does millions of things better than anyone else, than any other system, okay? It takes all the supply-demand problems, the vagaries of the weather, and balances everything. It's uh, mystically good at everything. It only doesn't do a handful of things well. And the handful of things on long horizon, you could, they have been called tragedies of the conquest. If you're not charged for polluting the water, dumping carbon dioxide in the air, dumping stuff in the oceans, plastics, and so on, and, and, and eroding the soil. These, these are our commons. Without these things, we don't exist. And capitalism doesn't even begin to have a mechanism to deal with this. It understands that if you can dump it, and it's cheaper than processing it, you're going to dump it. Unless you have a regulation well enforced, then you'll do it. As long as it's a level playing field, they have no trouble with it at all. If you give them a choice, they will take the cheap choice, of course. That is their mandate. You must not expect uh, unnecessary good behavior from capitalists. If you, the client, the consumer, can bully them, consumer companies will become greener and more sustainable. If you, the investors in the great Californian pension funds, can start to nudge the corporations, they will listen to you. But they will do it for those reasons. There are one or two altruistic CEOs, Unilever famously, Marks and Spencer in England, but you could get them in, in, in one hand. The rest of them are profit maximizers. If you use a corporate discount rate of 12%, and some use 50, and for a short-term project, like a software program, they want their money back in three years. They want a 30% discount. But even if you use 12, what happens after 40 years is irrelevant. You don't care that your refinery is sited 
much too close to the water in Massachusetts with sewing, okay? Because they knew it at the time. Because you've got your money back, the thing's an antique, and as they found out in the Houston floods, these refineries, when the water is flooding around, become real toxic at night. And since grandchildren are 40 years away, they have no value. Theoretically, to a capitalist, a grandchild has no value. So this comes up with my, basically my final story, which is a deal between the devil and the farmer. And the devil goes out to a farmer in the Midwest, and he offers them a deal for his soul, and in this case, for his soil, soil as well. And the deal is this. You will make three times the profit on every crop that you have if you sign the contract for 100 years. And footnote 21 of many little clauses uh, is that you will lose 1% a year of your soil, which is the rate they're losing it anyway, so why should they care about that one? So they sign, and uh, the farmer, his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and make out like bandits, and 100 years later, as the soil hits zero, at least when the starving guys arrive from Chicago, the farmers die rich. And I have been saying this now for five years. It has not been rebutted. I've written it up, it's been publicized. No capitalist has said you are wrong. There's no MBA from Harvard Business School that ever graduated who would not sign this contract. Indeed, they'd take them out and shoot them if they didn't sign it. And on that friendly note. <laughs> <laughs>
grow seaweed out in the deep ocean on lightweight floating frames, carbon fiber stuff, and grow those great things that you see in the California um, aquarium, um, kelp, and then come out <coughs> with a harvester and whack it so that it drops into the deep ocean and will stay there for hundreds of years. Now, there may be chemical complexities that will kill it off and they won't work, but at least it can be scaled. And if you can find other uses for seaweed, which is entirely edible, it takes its phosphorus out of the water. You cannot pay to get phosphorus out of water, it's too small. But they grab it anyway, and you could get phosphorus out of seaweed if you, if you got desperate. It's wonderful uh, fertilizer. It's pretty good when processed as animal feed. It's perfectly good human feed. The Japanese eat a lot of it, and Koreans, we mostly do not yet, but we could. And above all, to sequester carbon. Others? Two more. Here. Yeah, you had talked about population growth in Africa being one of the greatest threats to sustainability. I've heard that women's education is the best birth control. Is there any room for growth in that aspect? It might it make a difference? Yeah, it, it would be brilliant. <coughs> and just let me repeat what I started with. There is nothing that on paper we homo sapiens are not capable of doing. We could have solved all of these problems long ago. Uh, we know and have done for decades that female education is the single most important ingredient. Um, and yet we've allowed... The typical Nigerian when asked, how many children would you like, the men reply, eight. Fortunately, they only have six and a half. But they want eight. It's what real men do. And these are pretty intractable problems. And uh, you need a lot of female education and empowerment. Uh, but a good, sustained state program a la Bangladesh can do it. But the government has to be behind it. Mo most of, unfortunately, speaking as a capitalist, most of the things that we now face as major problems need regulation and they need government backing. It's not that a lot of help from people doesn't matter, it does. A lot of help from good corporations also matters and the scientists. But in the end, we've got to have good regulation. And in one or two countries, that is, seems to be anathema to such a degree that they allow it to overcome their belief in climate change and science in general. Only in the oily countries, the US, followed by Australia, followed by the UK, followed by Canada. Four English-speaking countries with well-organized fossil fuel industries. Only that, they do not debate the integrity of the science in India or China that really, really matter, or Europe, the length and breadth of Europe. It's really uh, amazing. <coughs> One more. Yes, Catherine. Thanks. Um, that was a really great talk, thank you. So, if one of the largest problems is population growth in Africa, then that growth rate is also going to demand more and more cheap energy. So, do you know of any programs that are, uh, what, well, one solution is to focus on the population growth itself with education and empowerment of women. But another solution might be to get those growing populations to adopt cleaner energy at the start rather than using uh, fossil fuels to fuel their... And, and they're well positioned to do that because Africa is a very sunny country and they have no grid, so they're well positioned to do it and they are doing it pretty fast. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is food production to, to help them produce more food, not dump our grain on them. When that's happened in the past, it's ruined the local farmers and made it even worse the next time. So we have to help them toughen up their agriculture, provide them with the latest generation of seeds that, that, not, that are not armor-plated for only Monsanto <laughs> insecticide, but are armor-plated against drought and floods and so on. Thank you very much.